the next steps were. So last class, we took the camera outside. Um, we shot all the way around. We tilted the camera up. We shot all the way around. We tilted the camera down, shot all the way around. Uh, we also did, um, to that sphere ball, we did the same thing. So my first stop in this uh, adventure was to um, sort through all the images. Um, so I went through Adobe uh, Bridge, and inside Bridge you can see what the settings are for each um, image. So I grabbed all the ones that were um, one eighth of a second, all the ones that were one fifteenth of a second, one thirtieth, one sixtieth, and one twenty fifth, and I put them into separate folders. That way I know which ones are the different images that were shot. Um, just so you can see, if I grab one of these, this is one of the brighter ones. So this is open for one eighth of a second, so it's going to be brighter. The lens is open longer, so we get a brighter image. Versus, here's one one twenty fifth of a second. You can see how dark that is, okay? Now we only shot um, four different passes, or five different passes. Uh, one eighth through one one twenty fifth. Now, what happened, I have no idea what actually happened to it, but in the 60th, there's not as many images. So if something happened when it was shooting a 60th of a second where it wasn't recording those or something happened to the images. Um, so this 60th of an image doesn't actually work. And I'll show you what happens when I even try it. Okay, you can see how many images are there for the 30th, how many are there for the 15th, and then the 60th, there's like one and a half rows. <laughs> All right, so my first stop was in a program called PT GUI. And what PT GUI does is it takes all of the images inside one of those sets and it puts it together into a panoramic, okay? So um, I actually thought that I had a license for this and I don't, it expired. So I'm in the process of getting a license for it. Um, so I'll have to redo this part, but whatever. Uh, I'm gonna make a new project. I'm gonna, don't save this one, oops. I'm gonna load my images, so I'll grab the 30th, <clears throat> and I'll grab all the images that are inside here. Okay, so what it's gonna do is it's asking me, okay, I realized that you were using a Nikon camera. Um, I can figure out the auto lens type. Do you know the focal length? Okay, the more information you can feed any of these programs, the better. Um, there's typically people who are like for movies who are on set who know this is the kind of camera you were using. This is the lens you were using. This is the um, shutter speed and everything that you were using for that specific shoot. Um, and it even goes down to image and sensor size, just so you can see what this is. Uh, DP review, Nikon D7000. All right, so this is the camera that we shot with. Um, inside this website, this is typically where people go to, um, somewhere inside here they will have the sensor size the sensor is like when you shoot the image it goes through the lens and then it ends up on this sensor that sensor size is different per camera per manufacturer per everything um, so it's important to have that information so you can punch that in so that it knows uh, those settings about your camera uh, if I search for this I just saw it too and then I started typing stuff right there okay so here's the Nikon D7000. The sensor size is 23.6 by 15.6, okay? So I could punch in that information right here and that would give me a little bit more um, uh, accurate information. Um, it's 23.6. Oh. 15. I don't know why it's changing that. I didn't originally change these, just so you know, I just left it the way it was. Uh, the default typically figured it out on its own, okay? Um, I did see that it figured out it was a fisheye lens. Um, it brought in all the images, so, oops. So I typically want to confirm that I brought in the correct images. Um, remember we shot the sphere ball too? So I accidentally could have grabbed one of the sphere ball images and dropped that in there. So. I'm going to align the images. So now it's going to go through each one of the images and it's going to put little markers in, in high contrast points. And then when it goes to the next image, it's going to do the same thing and it's going to try to line up all of these high contrast markers that make sense together. Okay. So what I mean by that is if you look at the building here, there might be a 
just jump to this. Uh, one thirtieth. This one. All right. Um, you see, there's a red car. <clears throat> It'll put a marker, let's say, on this red car. When it goes to the next image and it sees that same red car, it'll put a marker right there. Okay, so it's basically it's analyzing the pixels to figure out what that pattern is and then looking for that pattern in other images. Okay, uh, once it does that, then we'll get the panoramic. Okay, so all I did was uh, imported the images, hit four for the uh, focal length of the fisheye, and then typed in align images. So this is what I get. So this is my panoramic. And if I click and drag, you can see how I can actually like move this around. And you can see all those images kind of shifting and how they're lining themselves up. Okay, so it's pretty awesome how it's able to do that, especially how quick it's able to do that. Oops. You'll see that we do have some seams. So like right there by the cement, there's definitely a seam. Um, you can go in further and tweak the set tweak each image so I could actually go into this image and I could actually rotate that image around if I needed to or pick new points um, that's definitely something I could do um, right now we're getting an equa rectangular big word basically it means a lat long it's longitudinal and latitudinal just like a map of the world okay uh, we can look at this um, full frame fisheye if we wanted to so it looks more like that there's different ways you can kind of preview it Whoops. Um, for now, I'm just going to leave it as that image. All right. Okay. So once I was done with this, this is just the previewer. I'm just going to close it. And then I'm going to just say create. Okay. Um, the image that comes out of this <clears throat> is 11,800 pixels by 5,900 pixels. So that's a huge image that's coming out. Um, and then per set that we would have, we would have one of those images. So what I need to make sure of is that every image that I put out has the exact same size. So typically, if I round it to 11,000, then it gives me a nice number on the bottom, 5,500. It's easy to remember when I go to each one, just typing in 11,000 for that. Um, I also want to make sure I save this as something that is non-destructive. So a JPEG, every time you save a JPEG, you lose quality. I don't want to save it as a JPEG ever. I would save it as a TIFF or a Photoshop file. Okay. Uh, blended panoramic only you can um, in this program you can export out with individual layers or blended and the layers I've never needed to do that browse this is where I'm going to save it boom and then I would create the panoramic okay so what that gives me oh and I'll show you the other stuff here so here's cropping and here's for each image so you see how there's a circle there so it's actually like cropping out that area because it knows that that area is going to be the most accurate part of it um, here's masks. I don't think there's any masks on these. I haven't drawn any. Here are the control points. So remember I said it's looking for that red car. So if I go to number 12 here, number 12 over there should be probably about the same thing. If I go to number 2 here, number 2 should be about the same thing. Okay, it's pretty awesome in how it's able to figure that stuff out. Um, obviously they have to be close to each other, so I can't look at a number 7, which is showing one side of the building, and a number 1, which is showing the other side. So if I show these, you can see how it found number six, which is right here on this wall. And this one, number six, is right there on that wall. Number zero is up here. Number zero is right there. It's pretty awesome how it does that. Uh, you can change exposures and stuff. You can preview stuff, whatever. Okay. So that's that. Okay. So I went through each one of those sets and made a panoramic of each set. Then my next step was to come into Photoshop. So I went to uh, Photoshop. I automated merge to HDR Pro <clears throat> I found my images so here's my 30th my 125th my 8th and my 15th um, Photoshop did something weird if I told it to automatically align these images it did not do a good job so I've been leaving that off um, but what it should do I hit OK um, is it would bring each one of these images into Photoshop try to line them up just like um, PT GUI was doing try to line them up so that they're in the same spot and then basically create an HDR so if I hit OK you'll see it makes a new document it's gonna there it is bring in each one of these images now the reason that part of this is not lining up perfectly 
um, is because as I move stuff around, like stuff like the bench may be in a different spot. The camera could have jittered a little bit. The wind could have blown the camera slightly in one of the shots. So there's a lot of reasons why one of my shots may not be lined up perfectly. Uh, but you can definitely see that there is, you know, kind of like a ghosting happening here. And I could even narrow this down if I go into these. Um, I can see like which images are not lined up very good. Okay, um, these two are lined up pretty good. Uh, obviously, this one is off slightly. Oh, that one's fine too. That one's really off. Okay, so I could even decide: Do I even want to use this one? I could just kick that one out if it's giving me that much trouble. Okay, depending on how much data I have. Again, if we were to shot like twelve different sets, we have twelve sets to pick from, so we have more options available. Um, I'm actually going to not use this one because I don't really think I need it. I think everything else is pretty good. All right, so I also have this up here. I can choose um, basically my baseline. Let me turn that one back on. Yeah, see, you can definitely tell there's some distortion in that one. All right, All right so I'm good with that. So I'm just going to kind of save it to about there. So now what this is going to do is it's actually going to take those three files, because I didn't end up using the one, and it's going to smash it into one HDR, okay? So it's going to save it as a 32-bit image with all of that information. So all of those images are stuck inside of this one. Yeah, it's much cleaner than we had a second ago, which is right here. That looks disgusting. Okay. You can still see that there are uh, issues here. So if you look right there, obviously that doesn't line up perfectly. Um, the more money you're being paid the more work you would do to something like this okay so if this is pixar or ilm or something then we would go through and clean up all of those things if this is joe down the street just wanting us to throw something into a scene then you know we'll see how much joe is paying um cool so then i would just save this as and you've probably never even seen this before but once you go to a 32-bit it allows you to save things as an hdr so now i can save this as the mcc hdr and save okay now that slider that I had a second ago inside of that window is now down here you only get the slider when you're dealing with actual like HDR images or 32-bit images uh, otherwise that's not even available from the list okay all right so I brought into PT GUI to make my panoramics brought in a Photoshop to make the HDR now I would go into nuke to do the next step okay so here is let me just read it over here. So in Nuke, the interface is super simple as far as what it looks like, but it's incredibly tricky when you start to play with some of it. So um, everything has hotkeys or easier ways to get to stuff, just like every other program. Basically, I have to read in. So I'm not importing, I'm reading in a file. And this creates what's called a node that I could then look at. So I click on this and hit 1. I think I showed that before. Um, here is my 11,000 pixel image. Now, for me to demonstrate it, you can see how slow it was kind of already going. Um, I'm actually going to reformat this to something a little bit smaller. Okay, I'm going to go by 4,000 by 2,000. All of these sizes are, um, the width is double the height, right? So 2,000 by 4,000. Um, cool. So this should go quicker now because I've shrunk the size of it. Now, if we look at this, <clears throat> you'll see obviously we have watermarks that's you know because I don't have the full version but we also have the tripod here now going into Photoshop like this I probably could try to um, rubber stamp out or clean up all of this stuff but there's an easier way to do it okay and by easier it's because I've done it before several times um, so that's what makes it easier you would probably try to do it in Photoshop just because you're used to Photoshop all right, so let's see what this looks like when it's actually wrapped around a sphere. Um, I'm going to hit tab and then add a sphere to this. Okay, so I read it in. I reformatted it just so it's smaller, and then I added it to a sphere. So now I have this sphere that I could then go inside. And I can actually look around and see this is where we shot that stuff from. And if I look down, look what's right there, our tripod. See, there's the handles. Even though it looked like kind of mushy on the other side, there's the handles here. And then this is like where the tripod is. Obviously, we can't get exactly where the tripod is. 
Uh, we'll also see if we look straight up. There's also a hole up here. This is just where the stuff, it didn't know what to do up there. We had trees, branches, leaves, whatever. So we just said, nope, not going to do it. Uh, just left a black hole. So that's something else that I could uh, fix up. Okay. Now look at how horrible the quality is at 2,000, 4,000 by 2,000. Um, if I switch this reformat off, and I know what hotkeys to hit. There we go. Um, why do you look so horrible still? You should look better. Uh, textured, textured. Uh, it's just displaying weird. All right, well, typically it'd be better. All right. Um, there we go. Okay, so uh, what I need to do is I basically need to take that sphere and I want to take a picture of the bottom of it and then basically erase the bottom of it, okay? Um, so there's a process. So this is a website, Nukepedia. You can get Nuke scripts, you can get Nuke plugins and stuff and information. Um, you don't need the script for this. I'm going to show you how to do it by hand. So here's the lat long, what we have. Here's the 360. Now we want to take this, instead of taking this um, lat long like this, we want to export it out as a cube. Okay? That way I can see like exactly down and then clean up the bottom, exactly up and clean up the top. So I can take that inside the software and break it up into a cube like this and then fix it. Now this is what it would look like. So our lat long actually looks like this when it converts it from a cube or into a cube, okay? So just so you can see it, I'm gonna jump over to here. And this is what's awesome about Nuke. I can just take this image and then paste it here and then just drag all these to that. Oops. And now all the stuff that I just did to the um, other one on the side here now just gets updated with this. Okay. Um, there we go. Alright, so what I did is I told it that I wanted to see what the bottom of this looks like. So I added what's called a spherical transform. That basically takes my lat long and it converts it into a cube and then I can look at these individual pieces of it. Okay. And just so you can see what it's going to do, um, spherical transform. Okay, so I'm going to take my lat long, which is what I have, and I'm going to output it to a cube. And I'll look at this image. There it is. Okay, so now this is basically just like a corner shot. Now look how it's much clearer than we were seeing a second ago. Um, I'm going to change this to a square size, 2,000 by 2,000, just so it's cubish. And then I can actually rotate around. So as I go this way, look how I'm able to rotate and see the top. There it goes. That's pretty sweet. And if I go this way, I can actually rotate and see this way. Okay. And it's not distorted, which is awesome about it. It's just like, there it is. All right. So what I did was I added a spherical transform for each direction. The left of the box, the right of the box, the front, the back, the top, and the bottom. Okay. Right here, I have six of these. One, two, three, four, five, six. Each one of these is for one of those sides. So as I look at each one of these, I can see, okay, this one has a problem. There's a big hole right there, and I can see my tripod. This one, which is next to it, also has a problem. This is the ceiling. This one is fine. This one is fine. This one is fine. That one's fine. If we would have had someone walking, we could export out one of those, clean it up, and then bring it back in. All right. So what I'm going to do with this one that's bad is I'm going to export this out. Now, um, just for sizing purposes, this is 11,000 pixels wide by 5,500. Okay. So my cube should be a good size. Um, I'm going to make this bigger here. I'm just going to edit this and say. Uh, 
5500 by 5500. Cool. All right, so I read the file in. Now I'm going to write the file out. Okay, so I just said um, this is my new file name. Uh, what's nice about Nuke also is that if you just give this a new extension, it'll actually recognize, hey, you gave this a JPEG. Here's the JPEG options. Uh, I said save this as a TIFF. Here's the TIFF options. Okay, so whatever kind of file you want out of Nuke, you just type it in and it'll give you the options for it. All right, so I'm going to render that image out. So now what it's going to do is this image I'm seeing, it's going to take it out of Nuke and give it to me as a TIFF file that I could then go through and um, erase that out of there. So I'm just going to go to Photoshop, go to Open. I'll wait for this to be done. There it is. Um, I saved into 30. Export bottom new. Yes, there it is. Okay, so now I just have this flat image. And now I can just use the tools from Photoshop 1, which is the rubber stamp, and just airbrush this out. Now, this is much easier to do than remember when we had that big, long, stretched out tripod thing on the bottom. Uh, this is much, much, much easier. Cool. So now I can just save this. Um, I can save it as the exact same thing. It's a big file, so it's going to take a second. Um, and then when I come back into Nuke, I can say read file. And what it's going to do is it's written it out. I've changed it. Now it's going to read it back in. That way I don't have to do like a two step thing. So if I did read it back in, I would have a brand new file here. But with this one, I can just say, you know, read the file. It's still saving it. Like I said, this is a huge file. While that's doing that, I'm going to go to this one, which is the top. I'll say write. And export. Still writing that's crazy. I'm gonna close these other files. I don't need those open. It doesn't want me to save it uh, because Nuke is using it, which is what Photoshop does sometimes. So I could actually close Nuke, save it, whatever. I'm just going to save it as. And then what I should be able to do is just read it back in here. So I'm just going to uncheck this read file so it doesn't read it again. And then I'm going to read in the new one. Bottom. Yeah, that file alone is 66 megabytes. That's crazy. I should be saving a lot faster than this. This is insane. Uh, there are tools inside of Nuke also. Um, there is some uh, rotoing tools where I could actually do this in here. So if I go to this image... I go to Roto Paint. Um, these are basically like mask creating tools, but I can also use cloners, just like Photoshop. Um, it works a little bit differently though. So, so why aren't you working? Capacity, size, roundness, I can probably pick that up to 50. Looking at it, why aren't you doing it? This one. Oh, I didn't drag, that's why. There we go. 
So this one's gonna be a little bit more tricky because we have all these branches and things here. Um, I could also just grab a piece of the sky and put that there too. But you can see how just inside Nuke, I'm able to clone as well. Let me make this bigger. There we go, gorgeous. Okay, uh, that should be done in Photoshop. Yes, yes, cool. So now I can bring in that image again, new number two. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, here's my lat long image, okay? This is the confusing part about Nuke is how it does its stuff. In Photoshop, you just apply an effect and it's just there add text, you add layers, whatever. In Nuke, everything has a flow to it. It has a streaming of how it works. So this image here is being broken up by these spherical transforms, okay? So taking that lat long and making basically square images of it that I then need to put back together into a lat long, okay? So here's my original. It goes into these, okay? And then down here is my new lat long. So if I preview this now, you'll see that it's going slow again. Right, Four thousand. Uh, you'll be able to see that up here at the top, that hole is now gone. So we don't have the hole up there anymore because we've taken it and patched it up. We shouldn't have our tripod on the bottom because again we've patched it up. I've taken the uh, quality down just so it goes a little bit quicker. When you get into this thing's doing this and then going into this and then doing that and doing this other stuff, it has to calculate a lot. Um, so you see, there's the, the tripod, it's all gone. The hole in the bottom is all gone, okay? So now I would have an actual HDR that I could then use. So then I would just write this out and I would call it blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Uh, let's go up a folder. MCC final HDR dot HDR. Okay, and then I would render this out, and that would give me my actual HDR that I could then use inside of my uh, or whatever program as an HDR to help light my scene. So if I had an object I wanted it to look like it's actually inside of this area, I would have the HDR to do it. Um, we also have, remember that movie we shot um, of this? We could track this inside of Nuke, bring this inside of Maya, and then actually put our HDR plus this movie, and then we would have something where, let's say we had text right here, our text would be right in the center, all lit and colored like it was actually in the scene. Okay, for next week, I'll probably try to track this and get that set up too. Um, there's other programs. Um, PF Track is a, a pretty cool program where you can do tracking it's specifically meant for 3d tracking um, there's another one called Buju, another one called it starts with an s i can't think of it but there's several programs that are meant for just 3d tracking uh, which are cool um, also i'll wait till i get the actual you know hdr program so i don't have that stuff or the panoramic one sweet okay um Yeah, that's it. All right. Definitely complicated, right? It is not super simple. But like I said, what's neat about this is that this setup is now done. So whether I make this one HDR and never touch it again, or I make a thousand HDRs, all I have to do is go back into this image and change it, and it'll update all this other stuff. So that rig now, that, that script is basically set up for doing that every single time, which is amazing. Um, okay, so that one's good. And then we also did the sphere. Where's it at? This guy. Okay. So we also took pictures of that chrome sphere. So what I did to um, set this one up is I went into Photoshop and I cropped um, all the images. Actually, I went into Lightroom and cropped it because you can actually copy your crop settings from one photo to a thousand photos if you need to in Lightroom. It's amazing. So I did that in Lightroom, cropped it like this. Um, 
did the same thing in Photoshop where I went to the automate merge to HDR Pro. Okay, so then I had an HDR Pro or an HDR image. And then in here, I'm able to make that lat long and look around it. What happened to you? There you go. Took a second to load. Now in this one, it's actually, I may have clicked on the wrong one. Um, it's wrapping a 360 degrees around. Remember we only shot half of it. So we showing have half of a sphere. Uh, why are you doing that? You should not be doing that. That's right. That's right. Like two seconds ago, this was working fine. Crap. Oh, I know why. Um, circle map. Yep, that's why. So I already set that to 2000. There we go. So I changed it on the other one, so it changes there. Alright, so now I look at this. Perfect. So you'll see there's my sphere that I took a picture of. And then here is this black area on this side. Okay? So for something like this, I don't know what that is. Um, camera. Sphere. Sphere. So for something like this, where we just have that one side, it would really be we have an item in our scene, and we just want it to have some of those reflections kind of casting back into this, or some of the lighting casted this way. Um, you don't get the surround, which is obviously nicer about having a full 360, you don't get that backlighting that you would get or more of the rim lighting as much as you would hope that you would get. Um, this one could definitely work if you're in a pinch. Obviously, it was super simple as far as we just had the sphere ball and then we had that little planter thing. The process is the same for the rest of this. Um, you'll also notice um, this image is definitely warbly. Look at the, the cement here. Look at that. Because I'm using a plastic ball that's been in my office for you know a long time, um, also, it's not very crystal clear. I'm kind of fuzzy in here, too. Okay. Um, the people who do this, again, for a living or did that process for a living, they would get these um, steel ball bearings. And they would basically get one that's like, you know, uh, four inches or, or up. Like that. And they would set that on something and take a picture of it because that steel is going to hold its surface better. It's going to hold the shape better. Um, you can do a lot more with it. Um, but obviously, it's at the time, those were a lot more expensive and a lot harder to um, find. Okay. Um, yeah, sweet. Okay. So that's how you would do an HDR. Um, if you have any interest in doing one of those and you want to do some one on campus, we've gone through the process. We can go through it again. If you want to tell me ahead of time, obviously I can bring the equipment in. You can go and shoot one and then uh, we can put it together. When we get the license, it'll be on a laptop that we can, you can use. So not just mine or not just a teacher station, just like one that you can patch the stuff in together. Um, and it doesn't take Obviously, the organization takes a lot of time, the troubleshooting takes time, the cleaning up takes time, but the process for what you get out of it is, I think, pretty awesome. Um, especially when you go to someone's artwork. And you start looking at demo reels, and then you realize, oh, I've seen that HDR, I've seen that background, or I've seen you know this Brooklyn Bridge thing. Having your own stuff that's more centralized to where you are at and what you're doing is definitely more impactful to employers around here than it would be just grabbing this thing and putting your car or your product or whatever inside there um or alex's apartment this is a popular one people always grab that one especially because it's the first one um oh that was the other thing i was just gonna quickly show um all right so here was our final hdr right that was the one um, we could also go here and add like blurring. So remember the 
reflection one was crystal clear, but then the lighting one was defocused or blurred. So we could blur stuff here. Um, we can also defocus it, which actually is a better one than blurring. Okay, we can also do levels on it. We can bring these into Photoshop. That's not levels. Grade. There we go. Okay, so we can use that for our lighting and then use the crystal clear one for our reflections. All right, I'll probably actually go before uh, winter hits, which is a horrible time to shoot. Um, I'll probably try to shoot another one of these and have maybe 12 of these going around, you know, if there's a nice day. Um, if you've never been to Center Campus, Center Campus has some great areas too. There's a huge field that's just in the middle of all the buildings. That's a pretty nice spot to uh, get stuff. Sweet. All right, so I wanted you to see that just so you can see the process of what goes into um, each one of those um, HDRs that gets created. Um, like I said, you do one, it's, you know, obviously difficult. The second one's easier. The third, fourth, fifth, they become like automatic. Um, even stuff like these here, no, not necessarily those. Studio HDR. So some people will actually get these where they go into a studio where it's already kind of set up and they'll actually do an HDR of the studio. That way, if they have a product they want lit like they did in the studio, it's already there. They can just grab something like this and drop it in there. Um, there's also, a uh, program called HDR, it's not shop. Is it shop? HDR. Light, HDR Light Studio, that's what it's called. So HDR Light Studio actually allows you to create um, those kinds of maps automatically. Um, so you'll see like this watch, how it's being lit from here, 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 and there. In this software, you go into the software and you say, I want a light here, I want a light there, I want a light here and there. And it creates automatically an HDR for you based off of whatever stuff you specify. And what's cool is that you can actually have it synced between your software. So I could actually have Maya open and Light Studio open, start clicking stuff in there, and it'll automatically update an HDR into Maya, which is really cool. And I believe that this is free for students. Or you get a really good deal. <laughs> 95%. Uh, how much does it cost? 15 pounds. Yeah, so that's pretty much free. Okay. Um, if you're interested in doing that kind of stuff, check out YouTube. There's a billion videos on people doing um, stuff with HDR Studio. Um, in order to get these products to look good, it's not simply about just dropping in a nice product and throwing some shaders on it. Your lighting needs to be like perfect for that. Um, the lighting plays a huge role in making sure that this stuff is reading the way you want it to read. There's a bunch more product stuffs. You could have the best model in the world, but if you're not showing it off right, you know, what's the point? Sweet. Okay.